Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dave Forbes with Pepperdata. Today's webinar is Kafka Performance Monitor and Improve. And our presenter today is Pepperdata Field Engineer Kirk Lewis. A couple of things before we start uh, the presentation. You can type relevant questions into the Bright Talk control panel question box underneath your webinar screen at any time. And if Kirk doesn't answer those questions during the presentation, he'll address them in the Q&A that follows. And under our webinar screen, there is a console with links that are related to the presentation and upcoming webinars, free trial registration, and collateral. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Capriota Field Engineer Kirk Lewis. Hi, Kirk. Hey, David, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, I'll get right into it. So the topic today is Kafka performance, monitoring Kafka, Kafka performance, and improving Kafka performance. Our agenda is going to be as follows. So I'll start off with a quick architectural overview of, of what Kafka is. This is by no means a deep dive into that architecture. I assume you know the folks on this call pretty much know what that is, but we'll also provide you with you know, uh, a bit of over, a bit of an overview here, as well as you know, how to get more information if if you would like. And then talking about the big ideas when it comes to Kafka performance with any distributed system, there are things you need to think about and a way of thinking about performance and monitoring that I'd like to start off with, so that we have some context for the rest of the steps that we'll go through. And then monitoring performance, and then tuning the performance. So. Uh, in most cases, what we're after is a performance system that we know is performing and that when we need to improve the performance or when things start to degrade in terms of performance, we can get them back to where we'd like them to be. So we'll cover monitoring so that you know where you are as well as tuning so that you can get to where you want to be. So for the architectural overview, Kafka is at its core a messaging system. Messages need to move from point A to point B. Along the way, they start with producers. Producers will write a message, and that message will go to a Kafka broker to then be read by consumers. So you have writers and readers essentially on either end of this messaging system. And then Kafka has built in data replication. It is designed for very high throughput, very low latency, and it's very scalable. And as we'll see along the way, um, you don't get all of these without, you know, some costs associated with which one you'd like to get the most of, so to speak. So uh, with anything in a distributed system design, there are trade-offs that you have to uh, take into account when you're architecting, um, managing, and tuning these systems. So we'll make sure that we cover all of those things so that you understand what you're getting based on the decisions you make along the way as you're managing these platforms. So when we take a look at the architecture, you know, sort of a top-down look at it, you've got producers that are producing messages. There are multiple producers in uh, most cases for these deployments as, as soon as you get the Kafka environment up and running and you understand the capabilities of it and when you need a messaging system, it's rarely ever for a single message to go from point A to point B. It's normally for a lot of messages to go from point A to point B. So um, when we're looking at a Kafka environment, it's multiple producers, many, many brokers. Brokers host topics, which are the way that producers and, and consumers understand which messages um, they're, they're reading and writing and, and the path that those messages will take. And then partitions are the lowest level unit that we're, um, we're really looking at when we're talking at the Kafka infrastructure. Partitions are where the data is held. Partitions are the interaction point for producers and consumers, so producers write to topics which are uh, hosting these partitions. The partitions are also where you get your fault tolerance, so partitions are going to be replicated. And when you have, say, the default replication factor of three, you can think of it similar to other big data systems like Hadoop where each data bit will live in three places, and Kafka manages all of that for you in a way that is performance and a way that scales for you. So you don't have to manage those things manually. You're not copying data around, um, but Kafka is managing that for you. And the consumers on the other end of those topics are going to read that data 
and the rate at which they're reading that data is going to be essentially uh, you know, what you're looking to serve when you build these platforms. So can you consume all the data that the producers are producing, and can the readers get to that data in a way that serves the business needs? When we take a look at topics and partitions in more detail, a topic is going to host multiple partitions, and here we have an example of three partitions in a topic, and a consumer group at the other end of it. So consumers can be grouped into uh, multiple threads, so to speak, so that you can read at a rate that is faster than a single consumer reading from a single partition. And there is a concept of partition leadership. So a single partition is a leader. The other two that are hosting replicas of that data are following that leader, but the leader is the only one that the consumers read from. So when you have partitions that are hosting multiple copies of the data, those aren't all being read from. So when you want to spread out and be more multi-threaded, you have to have multiple uh, topics and partitions that will take into account reading from multiple topics and me reading from multiple partitions in a way that, that spread out the performance across multiple partitions without uh, having to essentially look at is the consumer able to keep up and is the producer able to keep up with the rates that you're interested in. So with the architecture sort of covered, we have the producers and the consumers, we have brokers, we have topics and partitions. Those are the, the big points that we'll be speaking to when we look at the rest of the performance picture. The big ideas when we're looking at Kafka performance are throughput and latency, throughput being you know, how many messages can make it through this system in a given amount of time, latency being how fast can those messages get through. Data integrity is, is all the data being written, is all the data being read, and is all the data safe? And fault tolerance is, can I handle something when, uh, when failures take place? And then overall capacity is how much, you know, how much do I have to host in the system in a given time? And we'll double click on these a little bit. So when we're speaking throughput and latency, there are metrics associated with these that Kafka will show you. And you can measure these and monitor these and keep track of them to make sure that you're on par with your expectations for the platform as well as for your business. So production rates are how fast are these producers producing? and consumption rates, how fast the consumers are consuming. There's also the idea of lag. How far are the consumers behind the producers? And when we look at the, the delta between those two, there's a very important component that we will look to monitor, which is the consumption lag. So it's typical in an environment, uh, in, in a Kafka environment, to have fluctuations in these data rates and understanding the fluctuations and what is normal versus abnormal is another point that you'll want to keep track of. And we look at those in a little bit more detail when we start to talk about trends. So uh, things like the size of the topics are also uh, things that you want to keep track of. Data integrity, for every read and write, there's going to be a corresponding um, the corresponding bit of metadata that gets, gets uh, emitted from the system. So you can confirm every write, you can confirm every read. There are acknowledgments that take place versus, for every message or every batch of messages. And the amount of confirmation that you need from this system is going to be one of the factors that you'll need to consider when looking at performance. So you, uh, you can certainly get very granular about data integrity, but there's going to be a cost to that that we'll talk about as well. And then when you talk about fault tolerance, things are going to fail in these environments. So this is all based on you know, standard, uh, standard hardware that, that runs Linux, and we all know that you, you have failures in these environments. So when you have things like network interface failures or uh, disk, disk uh, drive failures or server failures, the way that you handle those things, those failures are uh, – one, built into Kafka, so there's, there's fault tolerance in the design, but you'll also need to understand that 
none of these fault tolerance components are instantaneous. So the uh, time it takes to provision a new server if one dies and get it online and get it in sync with its replicas and get it online serving data if it takes over leadership. There's going to be a time between the failure and when the new server comes online. So the, uh, the idea that there's time associated with failures is also one in which you'll need to understand, you know, how much data is at risk during those failures. So let's uh, get into some of the specifics of monitoring Kafka performance. When we at Pepper Data talk about monitoring performance, we use the term observability. Monitoring is one thing, but then uh, we think of that as monitoring gets you the data. And observability is what is the data telling me? So Kafka doesn't self-report problems. It reports metrics. An example of that is under-replicated partition. So we've covered the idea that partitioning by default will get you uh, replication factor of three. And under-replicated partitions is a metric that Kafka will tell you. It doesn't tell you it's a problem. It just tells you, hey, you've got under -replicate. You've got You've got this number of under-replicated partitions. Observability tells you when that metric represents a problem and allows you to alert on it. So um, the idea that you've got too many underreplicated partitions and, you know, uh, the idea that, yes, I've got an underreplicated state or I've got a very underreplicated state, there are degrees to which these problems can manifest. So some you might just want to know about it when you get to work the next day. Others you might want to get, you know, woken up and, and attend to it in the middle of the night. So observability understands the difference between those, uh, those scenarios. And it also gives you some information about how to fix the problem. So it's one thing to get an alert that says, I have under-replicated partitions. It's another to say, you've got under-replicated partitions. Here's the host name of the field broker. Here are the partitions that were hosted there. Here are the topics, and here's the business impact that you're going to see because of it. So there's, um, there's a, a bit of information that you get from observability that you, that you don't get from just standard monitoring and alerting. So the concept of understanding some of these higher level, some of these higher level impacts and the layers that have been, you know, uh, impacted or the layers that had to fail to get you to the point where you had an underreplicated partition is the way we think about it when we're thinking in terms of observability over, you know, just, just standard monitoring. So, when we're doing monitoring in a Kafka performance, in a, in a Kafka messaging system, the way to think about things is, is in terms of the way, the way we like to think about things is in terms of performance gates. So we've got a message that starts with a producer. It traverses a broker, a topic, and a partition to eventually be consumed by a consumer. And I'll keep those big ideas over here on the right in the box that say, you know, throughput and latency, data integrity, fault tolerance and capacity as we go through these so we can keep them in mind. So the components that present these gating factors are the components that we've talked about. We've got producers. When a message leaves a producer, it's typically not on its own. It's been batched with other messages. So how big is that batch size? That's going to be a potential performance gate. Then how long is it buffered on the performance, I mean, on the producer before it's sent? And then what's the network latency and the network speed and throughput and bandwidth between the producer and the broker itself? And then were there any failures? And how often are you acknowledging those packets that were sent? So all of those things, when we talk about a producer sending a message to a broker, are potential gating factors in just the message getting from the producer over to the broker. So if you think about it going from there so then the broker receives it via a network interface. It may be written to disk. It may remain in memory if it's consumed fast enough. All of these places where the message may or may not land present a place where you have to tune and manage and monitor the performance of these steps along the way. So brokers host topics and partitions in a way that you want to evenly distribute. So when we talked about a leader being the only 
partition that can receive and send data from producers and consumers, leaders can move from one broker to another depending on the election, uh, the election mechan mechanics of w within Zookeeper that we'll talk about a little bit. But one of the things that you want to keep track of is how many leaders per broker am I actually running? So if I've got a cluster of 10 nodes and I've got 100 leaders across those nodes for simplicity's sake, best case scenario is I'd have, I'd have 10 leaders on each, on each node. Um, but the Kafka environment is dynamic. So keeping track of how many leaders are on each node is going to allow you to manage performance and your fault tolerance and your, your risk to data integrity because if you've got, say, you know, 50 leaders on one node and the rest spread across the rest of the nodes, if that node with 50 leaders goes down, it's going to be handled by Kafka, but it's going to take time to move all of those leaders to other nodes and have them come up uh, and to resync all of that data that was on that one node and to get that leadership state reestablished. So those are the kinds of things that you want to keep in mind when you're looking at load skew and total capacity of the brokers and understanding these performance gates will, uh, when we say understanding them, it's A, do I know which metrics to monitor and do I know which knobs to turn if I need to tune things relative to each of these, each of these uh, performance gates and each of these steps along the way, so to speak. When we're talking topics, there's topic health. Are we fully replicated? And are we evenly distributed among the hardware that we have to host this data pipeline? This is where we get down to, you know, all topics are not created equal. Some will have priority needs over others. And when you start to introduce failure states, you know, how do you handle priorities among topics? Some you'll want to get online before others. And when you do have uh, the type of environment that is not all based on the same hardware profile, and we're seeing more and more um, environments where you get to pick and choose the hardware that, that is underlying these, these environments, especially when we get to cloud and, and you know, these more dynamic environments, uh, you will get to the point of an architectural decision of do I base you know, this topic or uh, partition on things like SSDs or, um, you know, uh, network interfaces that are more capable and bigger hardware, again, with, you know, trade-offs associated with those in the realm of things like cost and time to recover if you've got very big nodes. And when we get to consumers, it really is about uh, are the consumers online and is there consumer lag? So you've got consumption rates and then you've got the lag associated with are the consumers keeping up with the producers? When we get to the metrics involved with each of these, we've got the, the, really the big four that we're talking in any environment. And these are the ones, as soon as you start to read about Kafka performance, people will tell you, you need to understand the number of under, you need to know when you have, uh, you know, active controllers, more than one active controller. You only want one active controller. Underreplicated partitions should always be zero. The number of offline partitions should be zero. Consumer lag is going to vary, but you need to measure it to understand and baseline what your normal is versus what is abnormal for your environment. So you start with those, and then you can start to baseline these other performance gates throughout your pipeline and establish what is normal for those. So just as these big four metrics have a normal all of these others will have a normal for your environment, and these environments will change and go over time, and you'll rebase line, reestablish normal, and keep track of those things when you're doing something like uh, trend analysis. So when we look at these discrete components, again, with the key metrics in mind, the producers, the brokers, topics, and consumers, the best resource to get your head around each of these and what, what normal is is the Apache documentation. So this is one of the cases where the documentation is pretty good, and you know there are technologies afoot that where you know, if you go and read the manual, you pretty quickly get to the point where you're going over to YouTube or you're looking at other articles that have been written to make sense of the manual. This is not one of those cases. Kafka actually has pretty good documentation, especially in the, in the realm of monitoring, as well as in all of these other um, architectural components that you'll be faced with when you design your system. So because Kafka is, is 
based so heavily on it's only successful when it performs the way you need it to, they've taken performance into account in the underlying documentation for the way you build, maintain, and, and manage and monitor these systems. So I would highly recommend when you want to understand what are the individual metrics that I need to be able to understand when I'm looking at things like the batch size for a producer sending data to a consumer or the buffer size or the uh, measurement of things like lag or how fast the partitions are going to move data and, and what batch size they're going to move data between the replicas. All of these factors are things that will um, manage the performance of those performance case that we talked about. Each of those is covered in the Kafka documentation in a way that makes, you know, uh, makes it pretty simple and, and easy to understand. And there's a level of detail that you really want to get your head around with that, you know, we couldn't cover in, in a presentation like this one, but pointing you to these things in a way to think about performance is really getting you, you know, say 60, 80% of the way there. And then the 20% really is that key 20% of, okay, what are the actual, you know, uh, settings that I need to go change in these environments? So when we go from that lower level of I've designed the system, it's up and running, and now I'm, I'm monitoring, you know, the things that I, I suspect are important, and you've got what you, you know, what you think is a steady state, you need to then watch the trends. You know, there's going to be, as soon as you get this environment up and running or you've got this environment running and maybe, you know, business units are changing the way they're using the environment, there uh, are things like topic growth. Uh, am I holding the data long enough for the consumers to get to it and for there to be, you know, business, uh, business value driven from this data? And am I alerting on the right things to get the, uh, to make sure that I have my head around the trends? So in these Kafka environments that are based on hardware, there is the capacity to host a specific amount of data for a specific amount of time and per topic, those numbers are going to be different in terms of how long you even need to keep the data. If you've got something like event data that's based on an event that happens weekly, the data might refresh every week and be of no use to you at two weeks. So you wouldn't want to host that data for two weeks. There may be other data that if it's not consumed within a few seconds, it's stale. So those are the kinds of things that when you watch these trends, there are sliding windows of usefulness for this data that you need to manage and make sure that as things change in these environments, like the production rates and consumption rates change, the rate at which you uh, fill up the, the hard drives or the rate at which you saturate your network interfaces don't force you into bottlenecks. So those are the things that we're talking about when we say keep up with the trends. And then there's also uh, Zookeeper as a metadata component. When we talk about things like leader election and maintaining data integrity, and how do the producers and consumers know where data might live for a particular topic within the broker scheme? There is a zookeeper component that also needs to perform in this environment. And um, when we look longer term at Kafka, the plan is for zookeeper to go away, but the vast majority of existing deployments still use zookeeper. So it is a component that you'll want to keep up on and make sure that it isn't being saturated by the work you're throwing at the Kafka cluster. And then the last bullet really speaks to, you know, there's, there's hardware underlying all of these things, all of these components that we talked about. So you'll want to, you'll want to monitor those as well within context of how do these hardware components impact performance. And, the, you know, there's, there's a whole other category of tuning that takes place when we're looking at things like drivers, driver settings for the hardware, and how you've configured your hardware to host these components within the Kafka framework. So when we talk about Zookeeper, I've got a whole slide on it because without Zookeeper, you're in a world of hurt. So the way that Kafka maintains its sort of um, sanity when we're talking about leadership elections and where topics are hosted and how you get to a specific bit of data, without Zookeeper, you really can't do any of those things. So you really don't want to lose the, the, the data in Zookeeper. And when you're looking at tracking Zookeeper and monitoring Zookeeper and alerting on Zookeeper, uh, many times those things are an afterthought for people until they get into a bad state with Zookeeper. So you don't want to, you don't want to end up there. You want to uh, look at Zookeeper as uh, 
a primary citizen within this environment that is monitored and that is tracked for health and capacity. All right, so now we'll talk about improving the performance. We understand the components at play. We understand the, the performance gates potentially along the way as these messages move throughout the system. And when we look to improve performance, there are knobs you can turn in each of these component areas when we talk about you know, brokers, producers, brokers, topics, and consumers. So each, each component is, has got its own way of being approached. There are tactics that you would use on the producer side that you wouldn't do on the, that you wouldn't use on the producer side and then brokers. So it's not, there's, there's no one way to tune Kafka. You tune the Kafka components when you look at the system that is hosting these messages along the way. And your first decision point is, am I tuning for throughput or latency? So is it most important that I get, you know, the, all of these messages through or that I get as many messages through as fast as possible? Or uh, is, is the fast more important than, than the total amount of messages? So there are going to be trade-offs. I might be able to get, you know, a million messages a day through my system, but the time to go from point A to point B may be, you know, 10, 20 seconds. If I need to get that 10, 20 seconds down to milliseconds, then I'm probably going to be able to move less messages overall, or I'm going to have to scale this environment with more hardware. So when you look at those things, you've got these, these knobs that you're going to turn and when you turn one, you know, other things are going to move in the environment and, and you'll have to take into account the trade-offs. So let's talk about the knobs. First off, when we're talking producers, producers, the job is to send messages into the brokers. So the rate at which you acknowledge that send. So if I, if I send one message and I have to have an acknowledgement for every message, that's going to slow me down because every acknowledgement takes time as well the standard way to do things is to batch these messages in a way that you're not acknowledging every one. Then there are buffer sizes to take into account, and the batch sizes are another thing that you take into account. So how many messages am I moving per batch? How, many, and how much buffering am I doing at the network layer? How much of an acknowledgement do I need for these messages? And then when the message gets to the brokers, how many nodes are even at play in the architecture? What's my replication factor? What's the block size with which I'm storing this data? And how does that relate to the underlying hardware or the network interfaces? How many network threads do I have per CPU to be able to, in a multi-threaded way, ingest all of this data? So when we think of these distributed systems, there are a lot of components that um, will need to be tuned because the defaults might not serve you know, the hardware when, when you get a Kafka cluster up and running. The underlying hardware is going to be of your choice, of course, and the defaults may or may not suit what you deployed in, in the realm of hardware. So those are the kinds of things when you're looking at network thread counts that you might need to tune. And then for the topics themselves, the number of partitions per node is going to be one of the things that you're, you're looking to tune and find the sweet spot. So, there is um, there's a bunch of measurements that you'll want to take to say, you know, is, is this the right number of partitions? You know, once you get up and running, the uh, proliferation of topics is, is not always within your control, but as a, an architect and as a DevOps team, you can control the number of partitions per node. So partitions per node are going to, as you look at the performance curve, you'll get to a point where there are diminishing returns for more partitions on a node. At first, it just looks like more partitions are better. But you'll get to a point where, you know, when, when you start to push over 100 partitions per node, where things don't, uh, things don't perform, you know, the performance curve starts to degrade, essentially. So that's one of the ways that you're going to be tuning things at the topic and partition level. And for consumers, there is parallelism, parallelism and consumer batching. So, I mean, commit batching. So the idea that, yes, I've read this, I've committed this read, and you tell the broker about it so the broker can then move the topic offset, basically confirm that, yes, this data has been read. And then uh, parallelism is, do you create groups of consumers so that I can read multiple threads? 
and do I just need more of those and more, cons more consumers within these consumer groups to be able to keep up with all the data that's being sent from the producers and through the brokers. And uh, one of the things that you don't, you don't really hear about until people are operational is um, pausing. So if production stops you, you know, or if, if the consumers die, do you have a way to trigger the producers and let them know that, hey, you know, this, this data can't be read anymore, so don't just dump it all into Kafka because it, you're, going to, you're going to overrun the space and the capacity within the system. So because of the architecture being producers and brokers and consumers, one of the things that is an operational challenge is stitching those things together in a way that when something dies on one end, does it make sense to stop some other things? So Kafka doesn't have that built in because it doesn't know the business process, of course, that you built on top of Kafka. It just knows I need to get this message through the system. So when you're looking at things in the traditional APM, you know, application performance management sort of thinking, there are uh, other triggers that you might want to set up so that you don't do things that don't make sense for the way the business needs to use this data. So there's always the business need to keep in, uh, to take into account as well. Um, I'm going to pause here and take a look and see, are there any questions I should tackle in the moment? Zookeeper Quorum, we covered Zookeeper as a key component. Yes, um, partition method. Okay, we can, we can revisit those at the end. I don't think there's anything I need to, to pause for in the moment. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So keep the questions coming if there are more, and um, let me know if there are things that I, that I don't cover that you'd like to, that you'd like to hear. When we get to turning those knobs and doing the actual tuning, there are trade-offs. So uh, there's going to be give and take for every decision you make within the tuning sphere within Kafka. So when we talked about what are you tuning for, whether that be throughput or, or, or latency, when you're tuning for one, you essentially need to sacrifice on either the other or, or cost. So you can spend your way to the most performant system in the world, but you might not get as much business value out of that system as the money you spent. So there's always a trade-off in the way you think about these things. For producers, when we talked about acknowledgements and buffers and batches, each of those has a discrete setting that you'll need to go make sure is right for the throughput that you're after. And the trade-off there is going to be speed versus data integrity. If I sacrifice and say, you know, I don't need to acknowledge all of these messages. If it's, if it's such that, you know, when someone pushes the button on their phone, if that message is not acknowledged and it drops when it drops packet somewhere, someone can just press the button again and it's not a big deal. Maybe that's fine for your application. Maybe it's not, you know. Uh, so the number of acknowledgments and how much you're ensuring that data integrity might weigh heavier than the speed at which you just need to get these things through the system. And then for brokers, your trade-offs are going to be speed and data integrity versus cost and management. So yes, I can throw more nodes at this environment and I can just spin up more topics. I mean, I can spin up more partitions, but there's also a management cost to this. So if I've got a team of three people and they're managing, you know, 20, 20 brokers, 20 nodes, you know, that might be fine and they might have great automation in place. These guys might be rock stars. But, and if I scale that out to 100 nodes, Am I looking at something different? Do I need to add headcount to my DevOps team? So um, do I need to then, you know, do things differently within the monitoring sphere? Or, you know, there, there are a lot of things to think about when you just throw money at a problem um, because there's, you know, probably more than one place that that money needs to be spent. Um, so when we're looking at things like, you know, scaling brokers and the trade-offs that you take when you're tuning for one thing versus another in the broker space, there are also, you know, budgets and SLAs to uh, keep in mind. So if the applications are not able to serve the business and you're not meeting your SLAs, then there's going to be some underlying changes to, to make at the broker, at the broker level as essentially nothing can move, as, nothing, nothing can move faster than the brokers can move the messages through the system. So the most performant producers and consumers in the world can still be hampered by the, by the broker. So there's going to be, you know, and um, an outsized amount of time spent there tuning. 
and managing those trade-offs versus the producers and consumer side of things. The topics themselves is um, the highlight bullet here is the number of partitions. That's going to be one of the big knobs. If you get that right, um, you can tolerate a lot of other things in this space. But there is the same set of trade-offs when we look at speed versus data integrity and uh, the cost of management. There's also the business priorities and the architectural decisions that will support those business priorities. So when we talked about those applications that need to be, you know, if you're, say, T-Mobile and you're hosting, you know, this, the, the, the big Super Bowl commercial and, you know, there's going to be a wave of traffic coming in, uh, it, it might be most important that you just capture all of that customer data from those potential new customers. And it's okay if they have to wait a few seconds for the screen to refresh, but you really don't want to drop any of that data because those all represent new potential income streams for the business. So the architectural decisions and the business priority, you might want extra capacity sitting there knowing that yes, extra capacity in a normal state would cause me performance, you know, uh, degradation at, at some other level, but that's okay for this weekend. So there are things like that to consider along the way, especially when we're thinking about things like trend analysis and what's on the horizon for this environment. And then for consumers, it's mostly about parallelism. How fast am I able to consume this data based on the business needs and the rate that is being produced? There's that same trade-off, but there's also complexity um, when we when we look at consumers and monitoring. So for every consumer that's supposed to do something, you need to be able to make sure that it's actually doing it. So if you take the approach of, I'm just going to stand up, you know, two dozen more consumers, I also need to instrument those consumers in a way that allows me to make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. Which brings us to alerting. So We've got, you know, the obvious ones are when we talk about those big four, number of active controllers, the under-replicated partitions, offline partitions, and consumer lag. Those are the things uh, that you'll want to, you know, those are, those are the, the, the baseline. You want, to, you want to alert on those in a way that makes sure that your environment's never at too much of a risk for data integrity or for impact to the business. And then beyond the obvious, we start to get to things like, you know, log flush, flush latency and megabytes per second for the network interfaces, and really a laundry list of things that can cause you pain in these environments that are not going to be sort of the, um, the highlighted metrics within Kafka tuning when you have that Kafka tuning, you know, discussion. And when you go and look into how do I tune a Kafka environment, how do I maintain and monitor a Kafka environment, Things like GC pauses hardly ever come up, but you've got Java components within these environments that, you know, they're going to slow down when they do a bunch of garbage collection and are the nodes swapping. So when you have a performance architecture that is predicated on keeping things in memory and the nodes run out of memory and they start to spill things to disk, so you're, you're going to have problems there. And then can the network interfaces keep up? Are you dropping packets? So yes, there's design the architecture, but also alert on the components that are uh, critical to keeping the architecture in a state that supports the business. So automation is really, in, in our minds, the only way to pull all of this off in a, in, in, in a way that allows you to succeed. So when you look at a very you know, small Kafka environment, you might be able to get away with you know, managing and monitoring you know, a few key components when we talk about those big four and when you get the alerts from, say, you know, the log messages that tell you something has died, uh, there, there's a way to get away with managing a smaller system. But as soon as that system starts to scale, you get beyond, you know, five, six nodes and, you know, 50 or 60 topics. There's this proliferation of all of these components when we talk about things like replication factors and consumer groups. Automation really is the only way that you're going to be able to pull off keeping all of these things alive and performant in a way that's business. So when we talk about leveraging automation across all these components, it's, it's really not, it's not even an option. There's, there's no way that you're going to, because Kafka doesn't come with any, you know, standard, you know, dashboard that tells you all of these things are great. Your hardware vendor is going to sell you their version of the thing that tells you everything's great, but the hardware vendor doesn't know you're running Kafka on this thing. So, and they also don't know that you've got this app that's running on top of that. So there are all these, these components that need to be stitched together in a way that automation really is the only 
uh, the only way to succeed at these deployments at scale. So for us, what support, what success looks like when you have these Kafka environments and you're monitoring them successfully via automation is you don't have any blind spots between Kafka and the hardware. When we talked about those other things that you need to monitor, those are mostly hardware-based and they impact what you've built in the Kafka environment. And you don't want any surprises so that you actually get alerted when bad things happen. And then you have the right performance data when things happen or as events take place so that if there's an underreplicated partition or a leadership, leadership problem where you have multiple leaders, so uh, for example, do you know which host they're on so that you know, your first job is not, okay, where's this problem and which node do I need to log into to go you know, deal with some, with some processes? Having that kind of information readily available to you is going to shorten your time to resolution. And when you've got these systems that are supporting business processes and you run into a series of failures, the time with which you can get back to a running steady state is going to be critical. And it's, it's, it, it can be pretty painful when you're in those out of scenarios and you, you don't have the data you need to make informed decisions about how do I get back online. So with that, you know, we have a product called the Pepper Data Streaming Spotlight that does exactly this. It automatically will monitor Kafka in a way that is non-intrusive but gives you all of this data that you need so that you don't have any blind spots, you don't get surprised by outages, and you have the right performance data. So when we look at all of the things that we've detailed as you know, the problem statement and how to fix it, we're doing observation of all of the performance metrics. We gather them and we synthesize them and we analyze them in a way that allows you to support your, uh, your decisions architecturally as well as in the moment operationally. So we automatically observe the throughput and latency. We automatically observe data integrity. We automatically observe fault tolerance and capacity. And we also support those, uh, those trend watching uh, activities that we talked about so that you can see over time. So um, there, there aren't going to be surprises today or on the horizon as things change within these environments. So Streaming Spotlight is a visual representation of all of those things that we've talked about, the production rates, the consumption rates, how much traffic is there, how much lag is there in these environments, which brokers are online, where are the leaders in the environment, how much load is distributed across the nodes, and we also have a uh, set of recommendations, so like insights that will let you know when things like skew across brokers becomes a problem so that you can maintain performance without having to watch the performance. So, you know, let the automation just tell you when you've got that scenario where there are 10 brokers and one of them is hosting, you know, 50% of the workload. That's a scenario that needs to be managed. So, you know, the automation within Streaming Spotlight will just tell you that automatically. And when you get beyond that to things like the trend-wise analysis that needs to be done, how big are the topics? How fast are they growing? Is my system maintaining a capacity that's healthy, you know, for me long term? Those are things that we're also keeping track of over time. And in the end, the state that you really need to be in is not having to worry about these things on a day-to-day -day basis and knowing that you've got a system of automation in place that will support the decisions you've made in terms of the priorities for throughput versus latency and data integrity and capacity, and will let you know when things are out of whack versus your expectation or out of line with the way the business needs these systems to perform. So in summary on screen, we're basically talking about leverage automation and make sure that you can improve the performance with the key information that you need and monitor building blocks within this environment so that you're not surprised and that you maintain capacity and you maintain a level of sanity within your ops team. And our performance product suite really is all about that. The Streaming Spotlight is part of a suite of products that are designed to manage big data systems and distributed systems, Kafka being one of them, in a way that sets you up for success in all of these ways automatically. And with that,
I think we're ready for Q&A.